Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Pot Still Live. I am delighted to be here and joined by Mr. Brendan Carty for <laughs> the Cologne Distillery takeover of Pot Still Live. Welcome, sir. How are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad, Matt. How are you all doing? Uh, it's about bloody time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I feel like you haven't been on the show enough. Um, <laughs> anyone who watches regularly will know that Brendan is a is an avid uh, a guest on the show. I'd say follower, but I think we've just dragged you on so many times. Brendan is doing so many cool things up in Clone Distillery. We've literally had you on probably eight times at this point over the different weeks between being a guest and just dropping in to say, uh, don't tell us what's going on in the distillery. Um, People are excited uh, to see you on this evening. We already have about 15 comments before we've even started the show here um, on, on Facebook and on Twitter. So make sure to say hello. And to everyone out there who has a tasting kit at home, um, first of all, congratulations for winning one. Congratulations, Brendan, for getting it to you guys intact. Um, and do uh, drink along and give us your thoughts and ask all the questions as the evening goes. Um, but Loads of people uh, dropping in already. Uh, Jean LK saying hi all. Uh, Lucas um, dropping in saying good evening. Ski and Kennedy. Uh, Tommy Ennis. Uh, Paul Callan up in Belfast uh, with just kind of a, I'm not sure, a groan of pain. I'm not really sure. He's already had all three samples out already. I saw him on Twitter, so maybe he's already cut through a few of them. Um, David Patton dropping in saying hey all. Uh, there's Mick McGuire. Um, Sean Carty. Uh, relation to yours, big brother, is it? Yeah, big brother. <laughs> um, we have Kevin over in Germany uh, as well, dropping in, saying hello. Uh, French again. Um, then, oh, I mean, absolutely. Actually, it's probably far too many people to say hello to at this point. It is literally coming in. Um, you're Sean, wants, or you're Sean, your brother wants to know if you look different now that you're married. Uh, so first of all, congratulations uh, on the recent nuptials. And then, I think you do. Are you just wearing like smarter shirts now that you're a, you're a married man? Know. I'm looking at myself here. I'm a bit peachy. Uh, I was out in the cold air today. I'm getting battered by the up in the mountain by the rain. And uh, you know when you come in out of the cold, your face into the heat. Maybe that's it. Well, I think uh, I think at least uh, we can put a bit of colour into your face with a few drops this evening. Um, but yes, yeah, hello to everyone. Delighted to have you. Um, this is the Cologne Distillery Takeover of Pot Still Live. Um, I'm delighted to have you all on this Facebook Live and Periscope. Uh, Brendan, we're going to be doing a lot of things tonight, uh, one of which is revealing the, the new 10-year-old uh, cask finish of your Bonded Experimental Series. Um, if you guys have got the samples at home, you'll already have seen what's on the label. Don't spoil it for the rest of them. Uh, we do have a special guest later on who was the one person that showed the name on their uh, Instagram stories. I can see them laughing in the background uh, in the backstage, so well done. I still shared it, though, so it's fine. Um, we also will be talking about, uh, Brendan, your uh, dark rum, uh, which currently I'm having a, a daiquiri with, actually. Um, and and I will go into this a little bit later on, but the kind of there's a nice, um, almost like caramelized burnt note to the to the rum itself, which um, I'm sure is a, a characteristic of your stills, which is lending itself to the stackery fantastically. Um, but I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Brendan, tell us all, what is going on in the distillery these days? Um, I know that you guys are flat out. Um, I know that COVID times have not stopped you uh, producing. Um, so what is going on? What are the news these days? Yeah, COVID stopped us for like, what's the, 14 days or something there, because unfortunately I got it <laughs> at my wedding, so uh, albeit a very small one, but it didn't really, we, um, I just left the place and Pierce left it, and luckily Hugh was off at the time, so we had the all clear, so Hugh was uh, taking care of the place a little bit, and then we just shut down for half a week, and uh, yeah, worked from distance, but uh, just before that, yeah, we were just busy, you know, turning out the rum, trying to get the rum out in time. Um, so we thought we'd, you know, it's a, it was a bold move trying to get a, a dark rum onto the Irish market that's, you know, Irish born and bred, no vatting or anything like that. Plus, mash bills, yeah, playing around with those a good bit. And uh, 
we had some good visitors up the other day as well. We had the BBC up on the back of uh, Fulton O'Connor's um, very important research. So they came up. It's actually very funny because the BBC were up and uh, they were like, right, take one. And then I went on my rant as I normally do. And they're like, right, we're going to have to do that again. There was a bit of background noise. Pierce was in the distillery banging and cursing and effing and blaming in the background. So Sean, the director, went in and he said, excuse me, do you mind keeping it down? Pierce apparently looked at him and if looks could kill. So then we're like, I take two. And I went in my five minute rant again. And then the jet came overhead, so we had to go again. I was just right, he was getting losing his temper at this stage. And he was right, take three. And I went on my rant again as usual. <laughs> then Pierce let out a big grunt inside. The director absolutely lost his marbles at this stage. He yeah. to walk away and come back. So, uh, so you're, what you're saying is Clone's not making the cut of that documentary then? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe a different <laughs> part. Uh, well, I suppose um, you said you shut down only for a small amount of time, and that, that's good to hear because you are what, what must be Ireland's smallest distillery at this point, but probably the most experimental at the same point. So it's great to hear you're still, you're still up and running. Um, we're going to be trying a good few things tonight. Uh, one thing I do want to shout out to is I have mentioned on the show before, I'm a keen fan of, of truck caps and uh, McConnell's, uh, a good, good uh, Northern Ireland brand, have sorted me out with a lovely uh, truck cap or a little mesh snapback. So I'm delighted. I just want to shout out to uh, Sarah McConnell's for sorting me out with that. Um, but yeah, so with everything that's going on, I'm sure you're going to be able to tell us a lot of the different tricks that are uh, and the tricks of the trade and, and what life's like making all of these whiskies from both blending, batting, and also the distilling of them as well in the distillery as we go along. Um, we are going to be joined by a guest, which I've mentioned uh, a little bit earlier on. Um, and I'm just looking around because I've got samples all around me, um, which is a delightful way to be. Um, but I think we're going to have some fun. Um, everyone at home, as I said, uh, make sure you have your sample packs at hand if you have them. Uh, and also share photographs of of what you're what you're tasting along on Twitter or also in uh, in the the Facebook chat as well. Uh, we see a lot of them coming up here. Brian <laughs> Brian and Kilkenny saying he likes the high tats. So do I, Brian. I feel you. Um, <laughs> um, bro, well, Dave Cummins wants to know if I'm doing November, um, and, and uh, I think we all know the answer to that. That it is probably no, considering up until recently my facial hair was too bad one centimeter longer than it is right now. And that took me since March. Um, this mustache is from March. So you know what? I think perhaps November is not the right one for me. I'll leave that to the people who are more, more uh, facially uh, like But like um, I suppose the main thing, what are you saying? Like Dave, more blessed with facial hair. Exactly. I'm thinking Dave, uh, I'm thinking that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, Michael Coleman, who is doing a, a good November push as well. You know, the people whom whom you know for their beards and, you know, not whatever this is. So I think Michael's rolling for November, though. He's he is. He already, has, he already has a massive beard and a mustache, so I don't know what more he could be doing. Um, but, yes, uh, Martin McKenna dropped in saying he has a wee dark rum port, so I'm delighted to see we're going along. Um, I already have a few few nips taken out of it myself, as I've mentioned. Um but yeah, before we get fully on kicked into the breakdown of what we're doing, I would like to introduce uh, our guest for this evening. Uh, our guest this evening is a uh, bartender extraordinaire, Miss Ali Hines. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hello. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Excited Not to be here. How are you, Ali? Um, I know, Ali, you were saying earlier on uh, you are going to have a, a we play with some of the different spirits that Brendan and ourselves are going to be talking about. Um, so feel free to interject at any point. Um, we're going to be having a fluid conversation, so it's going to be a little bit of fun. Um, we're going to be jumping into the whiskeys first, but Ali, why don't you give the people at home uh, a little bit of background into who you are uh, so that we, I suppose, get to know you a little bit better. Um, hey Jane, I've seen that comment there. Um, I am a bartender in the Exchequer in Dublin. I am by no means a whiskey professional, but I am an enthusiast and I love Cologne and I love Brendan and I love all the stuff they've given me so far. They're always nice enough to include me in all their samples and tastings, so I'm excited to be part of this one live for the first time. Um, yeah, basically I just make cocktails and talk. <laughs> That's why I'm here. 
Exactly. And you're saying this is possibly your first time going live because I've seen a lot of your cocktail videos online. And you're saying you get to edit those before yeah, they go into the Yeah, I would say, yeah, the videos I post are a lot better because you don't see all the takes that I have to do and all the editing. I could do an hour worth of footage and it'll be a five minute video. So I'm just hoping I don't say the wrong thing here, but all good so far. <laughs> exactly. I, you'll be fine. So, Brendan, I suppose, um, why don't you take us away on the, the big reveal of tonight's whiskey? Right. Yeah, well, we start maybe with the whiskey then. No bother. So every, it's probably the worst kept secret in Ireland right now. Uh, so it's the it's the Imperial Oatmeal Stout Cask. So, um, yeah, there is I, – I was bottling these, numbering these bottles today and sticking the labels on. So um, we got one to you. If you can see, there's no bottle number written on that because we – I threw that to you yesterday before I counted the bottles. There's only 350 bottles. Normally we're around 390. And um, I suppose we dipped into this cask more so than any other. And then there's a, a whiskey tasting or whatever. We all love Belfast Whiskey Club. And uh, Belfast Whiskey Week was brilliant. And we ended up giving them a huge chunk of it as well. So I'm going to blame Paul Keenan for losing a lot of it there. But <clears throat> more importantly, I came in one day and I seen Pierce bent over the cask, gargling away. So... Pierce probably helped himself to a good few liters of it as well. And uh, anytime somebody visits, we kept talking into it. We were loving it so much. So, um, yeah, this is it. It's a funny cask. We didn't know, you know, if this cask was ready or not. Um, I was trying to figure out all along, you know, is it dry enough? And then we thought it was overkilled. It was too dry. And then we said, you know what, we're just going to go with it. We're just going to let the stout cask eat away at it. And um, it was a really interesting cask. You know, we don't filter our whiskies. Um, sometimes we filter them a little bit, but we definitely don't chill filter them. This one here was non non filtered at all, and as a result, there's um, like a sediment floating through it, and it can be quite cloudy at times. So some of the other ones are bits of char. This one's got like sediment flowing through it. You'll notice that in your bottles if you if you manage to get one. So yeah, so everyone who is at home, please at this point do join in, uh, put your sample in the glass, have a nose. I suppose, taste along with us and let us know what you're smelling on the nose. Because for me, Brennan, I've tasted a lot of uh, Imperial Stout cast whiskeys. I've even uh, created one for, for work for myself. Yeah. And this, this has got one of the most kind of most prominent stout uh, noses to them that, you know, it's one of those things that's very hard to impress upon the whiskey itself. It is indeed. Where we got the stout from... Um... There's Morn Mountains Brewery, which is a local brewery. It's in Morn Point and uh, Kraken Brewery. Um, they do lots of really nice things. Um, I'm actually drinking one of theirs at the minute today. So, <laughs> um, but uh, I couldn't find any more of this beer. So this beer was called Hops and Steves. It was an Imperial Oatmeal Stout. Um, we took the cask from them probably around eight months ago. And it's been sitting in there a long time. And uh, yeah, the guys there, you know, they had... Um, they made basically a very oat heavy stout and a cologne. We love oats, so we were like, right, this is a perfect match for our for our, our whiskey. And um, unfortunately, my taste notes aren't great. I'm still suffering from a little bit of palate uh, disappearing from the COVID. So thank God Ali's here as well to help out. <laughs> a few months ago, uh, Alistair McCarroll and Ali both visited the distillery and uh, they tucked into the casks as well. So um, I think you've seen this one, Ali, as well, quite quite some months ago. So probably seen a progress over time as well yeah i i believe he he did an accidental reveal as well same as i did um i think he posted a picture of it when it was literally like no even word of it out there and yeah <laughs> well you know what you should start doing just put a big big label in front of it being like do not share this information with anybody that will be the only no. way it's going to get through but yeah you're, you're right about that that real stout smell like that coffee and dark chocolate mix like on the nose and i found that when i just added a little bit of water to it you get that more kind of fruity earthy smell mm. just like a dash of water but um mm. and i'm getting that kind of tobacco slight nutty flavor um but again with the water it opens up them kind of lighter fruitier flavors like apples are a li almost a slight herbaceous element but um yeah it's really nice and brendan why don't you tell us about how this i suppose these casts come together and then how long, long the actual beer stays in the cask subsequently with your cask mm -hmm. so um well, the components of the whiskey first of all you've got a 20 percent uh, county antrim single malt which is 12 year old uh, in fact this is 
over 11 years old at this stage. We just thought we'd continue the series, keep 10 year old on the bottle. And um, we, uh, luckily we got that uh, single malt from, uh, from Ecklenville Distillery. They pulled us out of a hole and sold it to us. Um, so we're very grateful to, to Ecklenville as usual there. Great bunch and this great camaraderie around the county down distilleries, you know. And um, so we, we've added that again then with, uh, it's, it's about 80% um, coolie stock, which includes, you know, uh, that lovely coolie grain. Um, again, 5% coolie malt, which was actually in, in sherry casks as well. So you get this lovely roundness coming. There's a tiny bit of sherry in there as well, which gives those, you know, fig sort of notes, especially when coupled with the stout. And um, so we've added those together on site. And then we put them into this cask about eight months ago. So this has been sitting in there a bloody long time. Um, we we initially didn't, we, we thought that the, this Bonded Experimental Series would be over. But uh, we decided to add another two releases. So this is now the penultimate release. One more to go. And uh, yeah, so we thought this is definitely ready. And we thought we'd bring it to market. So it's not going to be released. Uh, there was a bit of an issue with labels. So we had intended on releasing it tonight. But um, Jack Ass's producing our labels meant that uh, we, we now need to postpone the release for a couple of weeks. Which is fine because my wallet's hurting at the minute too. And I'm sure a lot of other labels are Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think that's understandable, and and that's always one of the things as well that goes in when you're doing a whiskey release like this that people don't think about as well. And particularly in the pandemic, one of the things I found quite funny from a professional point of view is everything was in short supply. Uh, label stock, paper was in short supply. Foiling was in short supply. Um, you know, even when you're looking at the rum in particular, you know, you're looking at a this is you know a banderol or watch strap. Uh, finish that comes from the labels as well you can't get the labels you can't get the watch straps you know you've got obviously a new label and a new bottle here so you've got entire myriads of of supply chain issues that are all just being impacted by covid which is which is quite annoying um but i suppose what are the challenges of of doing this kind of uh experimental cast series across what's net was it going to be uh, seven releases in total um yeah so like <laughs> from consistency and age and barreling and like what 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 are the kind of challenges you've found so far the biggest challenge is right now is um casks and lifting casks we lift them just with you know a hoist and um, we pump by hand and, and things like that with a hand pump and um, this is all very laborious you know it, um, it probably seems a good exercise but after a while you're knackered and uh, so we're trying to buy a forklift at the minute and uh, we've managed to budget it in this month but the guy who was selling us the forklift decided he wasn't going to give us any. Can't do that. We need for you know a business paper, so we're still lost without a forklift as of today. We thought we were getting one tomorrow. It was going to be like Christmas, but uh, that that's one issue. <laughs> so, uh, but what else? Uh, I suppose finding good casks, finding really good quality casks is difficult, and you know yourself, Matt, they can be bloody expensive. Um, we did manage to get some lovely casks from the ASC Barrels in France, and uh, this one from just down the road, which was brilliant. Uh, we got another one from Zoltan, which is coming down the line. So it's all just a matter of chatting with people. So, And then for a distillery as small as us, luckily Great Northern Distillery are working with us, so we're very grateful for that. But just uh, whiskey um, producing companies don't want to sell to small distilleries. They see us as small fry. We, we did... The, the big distilleries that are in the country, we've contacted them umpteen times, and you know they just basically, if they do entertain your your email or your 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 phone calls, they they don't want to hear from you, you know. And uh, so you know we're very grateful to the likes of Jonathan Ecklenville and Shane Braff to, to to pull us out of a hole with some quality age stock. So going forward, we don't know what we're going to do. Probably have to look elsewhere. <laughs> See what what else is is coming in the line, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything to be said for kind of banding up with other distilleries to try to you know increase the buying power or or is it is it kind of a obviously not with the likes of Ecklenville but you know or maybe Ecklenville I don't know but um perhaps other people of similar sizes or is it just trying to find those niche niche points to be able to go after I think there's a good point there. You know, I suppose we could uh, band together with a couple of distilleries. We do get on with other distilleries as well. You know, we're always in conversations and, and, and collaborating with the likes of you know, ourselves, Blackwater and JJ Corey and WD O'Connell. And you know, we do chat together and we're very supportive of each other as well. 
and uh, we're looking forward to you know constructive reform in the industry. So maybe we could do cap you know, get together and do that. But if we were all to get the same liquid, then what's the difference in what we're doing? So we're always trying to look at you know whatever whatever suits your palate. The way I the way we work at Cologne is you know we try to look for something that we want to taste ourselves, and if it doesn't exist, we try to create it. Um, that's what happened at the start. Non filtration. Um, cast strengths, you know, smaller bottles so they're a little bit more affordable, and um, really wacky experimental casks. You know, quality blends, quality blending, sort of a mess for a long time. I thought um, it, it was existing, but I thought there wasn't enough of it in, in the industry, and so we wanted to create that. And um, yeah, we we like to think that we're influencing the industry as a result. Um, so yeah, plus we're coming from a back of different our own different backgrounds. We weren't trained originally in this industry so we just had to use our own noses and our own skills and as whiskey makers we're just whiskey enthusiasts same as you guys and yeah we we just see ourselves as the market and therefore you're trying to create what the market wants yeah that's uh that, i mean that's that's also a, a good starting point as well when you're when you are the the litmus test of the market to being able to uh to try it yourself and see what you think you know yeah it's things are, at the minute are tough as well because it, it's great you know with these online forums that you can get tasting but you know it's nice to be able to call out to belfast or dublin and call in the bartenders and have the crack and you know uh, and, you know see see what they're what they're doing and ask for the, their comments and, but sadly the bars are all closed at the minute and ali you know better than anybody else how hard that is if the exchequer like your your home I know, your, yeah, I'm, I'm missing it terribly. And we were this close to getting Cologne in stock. Like my manager was so all about it. It's like, yeah, let's get it in. I <laughs> believe in this. And then it was just all closed down. No one's buying anything. Same all story with everybody. But. <coughs> all all right. <laughs> um, so I suppose from 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 your point of view, Brendan, I know you're a little bit limited on the on the, the olfactory senses. What what does this whiskey I suppose stand out to you as in terms of flavors? Because for me, there's there's and and, and actually I, I loved all of the the kind of tasting notes Ali brought out there, and a lot of talking about in the comments, you know, there's a lot of chocolate coming through, coffee, uh, earthy nose to it, and I'm just looking through some of these tasting notes. And guys, do do keep come uh, putting the tasting notes in there. There's I mean, there's almost for me, there's almost kind of a uh kind of a, a, to a toffee caramel like a roast caramel in there as well somewhere um I, i'm finding this very interesting um i'm actually i might i might dip out uh, to throw a drop of water in as ali said uh i didn't i didn't come prepared with my water this time which is a shame on me um but but yeah I, like what what to you does it, what does this whiskey do for you in terms of actual tasting notes even if you can remember your own notes. <laughs> remember, <laughs> yeah. Like, Ali, I know there's that, uh, I'm starting to get it back now as well. That, like, cocoa, you know, the way that bittering, that bitter sort of cocoa that you would get, like real fresh cocoa, and uh, chocolate in there too, coffee, and then like, burnt caramel, like you say. So, much more of those dry notes. This has been used a couple of times. It was used to make whiskey, then it was used to make stout. It was actually used to make bourbon. Then it was used to make whiskey from a Dublin distillery, believe it or not. Then it was used to make stout, and then it's come back to us. So you've got a really old wood now. So you're getting a lot of those drier, sort of more earthy notes, which is going to be a characteristic in Cologne's whiskey going forward. Uh, Cologne's trying to push for much more balanced whiskies rather than really sweet whiskies. Uh, we're trying to find our place in the market. And like our tequila cask was sort of pushing in that direction. And then this again. So what you've noticed between the different series as well, we're sort of strategically releasing them as well. So they're like chalk and cheese between each one, even though we're using the same blend. And uh, this this time, I think you've got enough dryness in there, a couple of those fruity notes that we were talking about. Um, so I suppose it's all just part of that process. It's, it's interesting to see it. But th those uh, old wood spice notes, I think, are working very well with, the, with those coffees and dark chocolates. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone has any more comments on the palate or what they're trying as we go along, please do throw them in. Um, when do you estimate that this would be on the market? And I suppose at what uh, what kind of uh, price point and what retailers do you think? Yeah. So again, the, the usual suspects. So we, we go with Irish Malts and then we go with Celtic Whiskey Shop. Anzac uh, would be our distributor in the north. And they would you know push it out to all of the, any 
good quality independent uh, off licenses, um, which is the milestone uh, in South Down or right across the north. Um, and then um, a, few, a few new people as well, um, you know, across the UK. So um, I, I'll put a, a post up of them later. But uh, yeah, so we're starting to branch out, which is great. We're also overseas with, you know, Irish Whiskey's DE in Germany, and we're looking forward to that festival as well. So yeah, we've got a good outreach. Cool. And, and what kind of uh, ORP do you think it'll sit at? Yeah, usually it falls around, uh, we advise um, 80 sterling in the north and uh, 90 euro in the Republic, uh, or probably a bit less in other EU countries that don't have ridiculous duty laws like Ireland. Sorry. Yeah, they're pretty much um, um, And what... Um, I was going to say, how many bottles did you say? Because I know you said that there's less bottles than than usual uh, for this release. How many did you say there were? 350. Uh, 350. I uh, huge smashed one this evening when we were writing on them. So it's actually 349 now, but we started writing 250. So that's that's the amount that there are. Um, but there's, there's a funny thing about it as well. It's, it's actually it's 51.4%, I think this one actually is, um, when we measured it today. So um, it's a bit less than we had thought, which is crazy. I think most of them are around 55. Uh, I don't know why this one's so much less. I think it's because maybe there's a large chunk taken out of the cask, so there's a lot, much, a lot more breathing room. Plus, it's been in there a lot longer as well, so it's been in there the same time as the rest of them when they were taken out earlier. So, uh, yeah, it does need a bit of water, but don't be putting in just as much as you normally would with the likes of your Chocolino one. Mm -hmm. um, Matt Morrison wants to know when is Cologne coming to the States? I'm wondering the same thing. Uh, as you know, we're a team, and uh, there's myself, the Shane McCarthy, and Liam Brogan. Uh, I founded the company together, and uh, I like to put the pressure on Liam about this one. <laughs> He's working on that. Plus, we've got a brilliant graphic designer who's trying to put the labels together for the States. So what we're actually going to do, Matt, is go to the States with the full bond experimental range in smaller bottles just 375 so yeah that's that's something to look forward to they look brilliant uh, and i can't wait so what we've actually done is refilled all those casks again just to a certain amount two-thirds full and we're pumping them all out to the states and we really can't wait so that's pretty cool. uh, do you have any estimated time on that or is it just a tbd uh, it is going to happen we're aiming for now, which we've missed, so we're hopefully get it out before Christmas. If not, January at the very latest, or I think I'm going to freak. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll get there. It's You know yourself, when you're working on a lot of new products all the time, it just takes your energy away. Plus, we're, we're a very small outfit. Um, everything's yeah. done ourselves. So. But no, it, it'll, it'll be great when it goes there. Plus, we didn't want to create anything new for the States because you know we've got people here who respect the whiskey that we're doing. And it wouldn't be fair, in our opinion, you know, that something would exist in the States and wouldn't exist here. So I have to keep that in mind. Definitely. <laughs> no, and that's very fair. And I think I, I, I saw John O'Donnell there from Irish Malts throwing a bit of slagging in the comments. Um, and one of the things I know from, from my professional life, we had a, 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 a project of yeah. what I worked on uh, for actually quite a while. Um, and then kind of out of, out of a, a commercial deal that went on that uh, was a, a one-off release was going to be whatever a couple of thousand cases um but uh it ended up becoming an australia exclusive um to right. for to fulfill this it was kind of a it was a, a, a cherry on top of a deal and the deal was great so it worked out well for commercially but that was one of the things we did we released uh 72 bottles for Europe to at least be able to deliver something to the home market because worked on this project for like three no two two and a half years and then to have it taken away to the other side of the world and you're kind of just sitting there going like you're, it's, it's deflating almost for two reasons because you've got a home market that you know want to enjoy and partake and imbibe and support you but then also I don't know, like I was planning to go around to sales shows for the next year you know pre-covid uh to flog this you know what i mean talk to people about it get them yeah. to try it get them engaged and i've just gone and now in one way you know commercially it's great that the whole lot's gone off to australia and won't go but like <laughs> you're sitting there going ah. you want to be part of it don't you and i honestly yeah. 
Yeah. Was this the stout finish or what was this? Uh, no, uh, the there was a twelve year old triple cast finish. But sure, look, we're not talking about me. We're talking about your your. your <laughs> and, like the guys, yeah. your, your, base, your base deserves a say in the market. You know, they deserve a say in terms of they, they helped you grow your brand. So if they, I think you have to keep in mind whatever you do going forward. You know, and and I agree with you. It's one of the things I've talked about internally and with the guys in Irish malls and stuff as well, and you know other retailers in Ireland. Um, that anything we're releasing is kind of exclusives elsewhere. There'll be a small amount retained for the Irish market to at least give access to, because, you know, the outfit we work for, that are like you're small enough to be able to do that where, where it kind of works that way. But back just, just to kind of finish up on the actual tasting notes of the whiskey. Uh, one tasting note that came in here from Sergius in Irish whiskey magazine, he says a hint of grapefruit rind. And I am, I've been staring at this. I can actually see comments piling up now because I've held it <laughs> on surges. On the palate, on the finish, I absolutely get a, a, a dry grapefruit rind. And I think that's an absolutely fantastic tasting note for me. Um, and Jarlith Watson dropping in saying it has changed so much since you tried it in May or June. More yeah. earthy, it's still there, but more subdued. I and it's really had this a few a few times over his life. Yeah. yeah, it's been in there a long time. You think about it. Mm. Well, I, I for one, am loving this. Uh, as you said, each of the the clone releases have been entirely different. Yeah. Um, and I, you see a few of them behind me here. Um, but this is something I'm very much looking forward to seeing coming out on on the open market. Um, I'm presuming you can't give us a hint about what the the ultimate uh, release is. If this is an ultimate release. What the what the ultimate release of the bonded series is going to be, but I'm sure you've like, I can tell you what it tastes like. It tastes like clove rock. It's got so much clovey wood spice in it. It's fantastic. It's an absolute bomb. Which Sounds is great. great. Yeah, I just want to, Ali. You're the one who's in. You, you know, when it comes to food pairing and drink pairing and and, and that, is it in terms of some spirits are more versatile than others? What do you think would go well with that, or how could it be served, or if you um. Enjoy? Like what? What food it would go with, or how would it be served in a in a cocktail? In a cocktail, or or even if you had it with an pint or whatever. in a cocktail. <laughs> like? a point of Guinness and this on the side. That's all you need. <laughs> now, um, I would say like because of the coffee and dark chocolate notes that are coming through, it'd be hard. Well, also because this is such a nice whiskey, and I'm usually a, a drink whiskey neat kind of person, but mm. I'd want it to be in kind of like a stirred down boozy drink where it still stands up. You know, not like. I don't know, kind of lost in a in a long drink or something. Um, so mm. I'd be teetering on kind of old fashions or maybe even like something with a little bit of coffee and like cherry with a bit of smoke or something would be kind of bring out those kind of fruit flavors a bit more as well. Because like everyone's saying, it's predominantly like chocolate and stout and uh, coffee on the nose. But once you add that little bit of water, you get those like ripe fruit kind of fruity flavors. So it'd be interesting to actually play around with it and see. Um, the one thing is I, d I told Matt that I'd play around with a few cocktails, uh, but I only did the rum because I got so excited with the tiki aspect of it. And I oh, love good. whiskey on its own. And that's no insult because this is amazing just on yeah. its own. That's so, very no, I yeah. agree. You may notice I actually muted myself and dipped off for a second because I just wanted to try it with a drop of water. Like Ali said, I'm loving this. I think it's great. Lovely. Good man, Matt. I I've seen Ian Brogan, uh, Mr. Sales of Cologne Distillery, saying that he's a 20 foot uh, container order waiting for the US. So uh, he wants you to hand label that Sharpie and bottle seven and a half thousand uh, units in two new bottle sizes. Um, he says, You've three, three sheds up the lane on the side of a mountain. This is going to be a challenge to put it all together. Um, but he it's says, so. <laughs> yeah, you got to get it in December, uh, and it's landing in February. So uh, that's a, that's a challenge for you right there. Um, and also, I'm, I I I am no legal expert by any means, but I'm pretty sure that your sharpies were brought to you by the FSAI. I don't know if they were or weren't the the sharpieing out the information. But as far as I know, they they only have access to to criticisms if it's on the Irish market. I don't know. Who knows? I'm not sure. I'm no legal expert. But that might be right. I think you're right. Here, I actually have what is it? 
the 12 boxes there today and i forgot to sharpie them i have to open them now again and sharpie them <laughs> I, <don't> <laughs> I actually mentioned earlier on that there's a lack of sharpies um, oh. but anyway yeah, sure look, yeah. it's fun uh but brendan oh yeah ali i think ali's a little, a little <laughs> The dark room, I don't think there's a Sharpie issue. Uh, but no. Brendan, why, if we move on from uh, this fantastic uh, whiskey, and again, guys, anyone who wants to ask questions in the comments, uh, feel free. Uh, this is exactly what this whole takeover is for. Um, the, this, uh, this is the uh, clone distillery takeover of potstill.com. Ask the questions you want to ask because this is the unbridled access uh, to Brendan and also to Ali uh, while she's here. Um, I won't be able so, to give you as much information as these two, though, but I'll answer phone questions. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, but why don't we move on to uh, the Clone Dark Rum, Ireland's first homemade uh, dark rum. And uh, Brendan, I know there's a, a very cool both distillation technique you use on this, but also your maturation technique on this. And then Ali, I, I've got my little cocktail here, so I'm expecting you to have something uh, uh, something fun and cool in the background. <laughs> okay. It doesn't look as fun because it's been sitting here for a while, but it was very fun a while ago. <laughs> Thanks. Looks great. Um, Frank me. Do you want me just to, just to give a wee rant about it? Where's my bottle? <clears throat> oh, it's right. What are you known for? So I, but this is our new this is our new bottle. Um, pretty cool little bottle, and uh, we got. One of the main issues with the, the current bottle is, you know, the hip flask bottle, which we're not doing away with, by the way. Whenever you stick it on the shelf, you know, you can't see what it is. Everyone's like, what the hell? So they don't want to buy it. And, and Ali, you know, I work in a bar as well for long enough. There's no space in the bloody bar. And somebody who, you know, doesn't really know the bar, they come in, they tidy it up, and they just, you know, see that bottle gets lost on a lot of, a lot of shelves. But at least with this, you know, when it goes along the shelf, you can see it's his dark room. I have to apologize about the little crease in the bottom, by the way. Um, somebody put a comment up on one of the pages that Pierce must have put them on with his toes. <laughs> <laughs> they tend to crease a bit um, because the bottle's concaved, and we didn't know that. It's very slightly concaved, and the label has to go somewhere, so it starts to fold in on itself a little bit. And uh, So we're going to try and get tapered labels from now on. But she's still a beaut, and, and uh, it's a th it's just it's a testament to show that you know things are done by hand, and it's not perfect. Nobody is, and nothing is. Although I love we do, it. <laughs> and uh, it, as well, this this dark rum, right? It's it's this it's one hundred percent Irish. So there's a lot of rums in Ireland that are spiced rum. Uh, Cologne doesn't do spiced rum. Um, doesn't do bought in rum. We might do bought in rum. We might buy something from Barbados or somewhere and. You know, leave it in the cask and sell it. Nothing wrong with that. But for us, we wanted an Irish born and bred rum. Uh, we don't think it's been done before in Ireland um, that it was 100% fermented here. Fermentations, like our all our fermentations, are good fun. Probably rant about that in a minute. But so we put it through a, th a thumper keg in our still as well, which is, equates to an extra half a distillation. So it was well, such a heavy one. Okay, why don't you explain what a thumper is? Because anyone who's okay. not familiar with bourbon isn't going to know at all what a thumper or a doubler is. So you imagine you've got your still here, and then you've got your condenser here, and the vapor goes from the still into the condenser, and it comes out as a liquid. Imagine in between you had another thing suspended in the air, so that another copper basket, and the vapor has to move through this copper basket before it gets into your condenser. Therefore, it's actually it's called a rectification. So when you have more copper in your process, any residual sulfates inside that vapor, when they interact with the copper, you know they turn into other chemicals that give you like uh, esters, fruity notes, for example. So that extra interaction with the copper just gives you a much more mellow spirit because this was a bloody heavy rum at the start, and although we had quite an aggressive casking program, which purred that back a bit. So the next batch of this in six months' time will probably be very different. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the idea of making it. Um, Thumper keg rum. But uh, one thing I'd like to say about rum is that it, it wasn't originally an Irish spirit, although at one stage we were drinking more rum in this country than we were drinking whiskey. Um, I want to just quote Fanon O'Connor in that because I'm not an expert. And uh, rum is important because uh, it was created by, you know, Basically, it is a very dark legacy of slavery. 
So for every bottle sold, we're donating one pound, you know, to the to the Windrush Foundation and um, just a bit of a testament and a bit of respect and a nod to those people, um, you know, who, who created who created rum and are still being people are still being exploited to this day with no wages um, in certain parts of the world. So a small rant there on that point. Yeah. And um, yeah. Can you give a rundown of what what the what the actual casking regiment looked like for this rum? And also, someone has asked in the comments as to what age the the rum is itself. Yeah. The reason why there's no age statement on this is because it hasn't got an age. It is not yet one year old. So there was about twenty percent of this was four months old, and the oldest bit was distilled last Christmas uh, or last January. So. Um, this originally started whenever it was last Christmas and we had no staff and I was still really eager to work and uh, I couldn't bash in and everything and you know all on my own and do the whole whole thing. I'm not Superman and I'm not Pierce Tar. So I said, right, okay. What I can do is get a lot of molasses and get a lot of sugar and uh, put hot water and yeast and ferment that. It's much easier. But the problem was it took that bloody long to ferment because we do open top fermentations and we let it, let it lie outside. So chatting with some of my distiller friends in Scotland and they said, oh, your, your yeast needs nutrients. So what we did was we pitched more yeast, but this time we added um, a carton of, uh, of uh, tomato, one litre of tomato juice and that acted as a nutrient for, for, for the yeast. And uh, it gave it a kickstart, and, and uh, it took two. These fermentations take two weeks every time we do them. Um, we open them up, open them up, and let that wild bacteria and the wild yeast in our local atmosphere to get in there as well. Um, <laughs> whenever we were fermenting this as well, uh, it creates those extra fruit. You know, but when we done it this summer, there was a hell of a lot of wasps. You can imagine what wasps are like around this. Kept jumping <laughs> in as well. So, yeah, <laughs> but we don't mind. Everything gets boiled twice and you're you're producing 70 percent alcohol or higher um, and you're making so a, a few wasps in there would give it a good buzz i suppose uh, <laughs> oh my god the, yeah. <laughs> there's a, you know, a lot of activity in the fermentation tanks so there was a hive of activity you might say hey yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's your turn. laughs> i want to leave now <laughs> well, i think i think I yeah, yeah. Ali's, uh, Ali's thoughts and advice on <laughs> sorry, Alan Morwell just says boo. <laughs> <laughs> Alan can't say anything about shy jokes, to be fair though. Uh, but yeah, uh, this has possibly one of the most interesting um, flavor profiles of a rum I've ever tasted. Um, what, what, after you've done your kind of long fermentations with your tomato or pineapple juice thrown in, um, what what is the the process after that because it says on the front label not only to say uh pump or keg distill direct flames uh but you also have a celera method written on the front yeah. label which is just so, underneath the dark right um, in there you've probably asked me that three times and i never i kept getting distracted i'm very sorry yeah. <laughs> uh, it is yeah so what we do is we we put it through a series of casks um that we've got six firkins, um, 50 liter casks that once held American bourbon. And I asked for them to be, you know, quite heavily charred and the insides of them were probably scored or something with, so there's quite an aggressive, uh, you know, um, American oak uh, influence there. And uh, so that Quercus Alba gives it a lot of vanilla heavy notes. So, um, which is fine, it was great. Uh, and then when it moved from that, it then goes into a PX cask. And the PX cask gave it a lot of fig and a little bit of um, tanginess as well. And then it went into these heavily charred Cabernet Savion casks, which are beauts. There's two of them. And uh, they're absolutely wonderful. So we, it's going through this pyramid, except we just take from the bottom of the pyramid and then put them into the Cab Sav cask. So the actual location of the Cab Sav casks are not underneath the pyramid, if you, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but this thing to slur we can get. So once we get those emptied, we're gonna build this pyramid. It's gonna be brilliant. But <laughs> it still moves in the same in the same process. So this is our interpretation of the slur method. And uh, it moves from one cask into the next cask and then down into the next into the next. So right now we've now been, you know, pulling leave it. We we leave each stock in every cask. No cask is fully emptied. 
so that um, it's just constantly going through the vat and there's always the oldest spirit in there. So that's the idea. But we might change that in, in a few years' time in order to try and give it an age statement, you know, to try and make sure that there's at least one cask here of age spirit uh, every time. Um, but yeah, play it by ear. Uh, it's all about flavour and it's all about experimentation. Um, just a question on the molasses. Where do you source the molasses from? Uh, there's a company called Andrews Ingredients, which um, supplies all of the local bakeries. Um, we are trying to reach out, you know, to overseas suppliers so we can get a bit of, you know, provenance and know exactly where the molasses is coming from. But we, we can't actually do that at the moment. It's run such a small industry here that um, sourcing it isn't brilliant. So uh, molasses is it's actually twice the price of sugar as well. So we want to, we're doing a 50-50 sugar to molasses smash here. As well. I was going to say, is that is there a reason for that? So it's price more so than anything. It, it's just oh no, we most people traditionally I think it, molasses was a byproduct and it was you know people used more of it because it was cheaper. But now we're actually trying to use as much as we can. Yeah. Uh, any of our Scottish friends that are making rum, we're chatting to them and they're using twenty percent molasses. But we're actually using fifty percent, which is massive, you know, and it's 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 very expensive for us to make this. We're buying it directly as well from. You know these uh, bakery producers and bakery suppliers as well, so it's it's expensive stuff. Yeah. yeah. So so for the people back home who are, aren't aren't rum makers, what 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 is the difference between I, I suppose your your sugar and your molasses that you're using in the, in the fermentations? Yeah. So you would sort of see sugar as more of a primer sugar, and molasses uh, it isn't really fermentable, so it relies on you know the normal sugar refined sugar to, to create momentum and then the molasses starts to to ferment off that if you just pitched yeast into into uh molasses and water it, it wouldn't ferment you need normal sugar in there too and the rest of the molasses it's a bit like an adjunct in in your pasta it's like making pasta whiskey you know your own malted barley's it doesn't all malted grains do not want to ferment so you need to have a lot of other you know malted produce in there to, to kick them off I think very basically you would describe it as a primer sugar. Um, I know a lot of distilleries, distillers would probably kill me for saying that, but we're just trying to speak in layman's terms. Absolutely. And, and Ali, I know you were showing off uh, 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 what what you believed was a nice uh, tiki looking cocktail, and I still think it looks nice. Um, and what, what, what uh, experimentation did you get to do uh, on, on this drum? Well, obviously, I have a lot more kind of supplies than the average at-home bartender would have. So uh, the one I have in my hand is actually, it's its not even that tiki per se. It's just its just kind of ingredients that you might have at home. So it's just uh, the rum, uh, apple juice, lemon, a little bit of sugar, um, and then a dash of Angostura bitters, which I just realized now is probably not that common. But just to add that one dash of herbaceousness and bitter component. But I was thinking... Um, it would be great as well in a dark and stormy with ginger beer. I feel like it would hold up well in a jungle bird as well with Campari and pineapple juice. Um, maybe even like a hurricane or something, passion fruit, lemon juice, rum. Yeah, I, I'd be excited to try this because I love the slight kind of vanilla on the nose, but then that honey molasses and like buttery mouthfeel. And I just think it stands up really well in a tiki cocktail as well as a sipping rum because I wouldn't be one for sipping rums. Like I do love rum, but I usually like it in cocktails, but I'd also just sip away on this by itself. It's really, really good. Mm -hmm. and, and quite different, I think. I've I've yeah. it's been it's been a been a hot minute since I've I've sat down with the sipping rum, but uh it's uh yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting and it's quite different from a lot of other other rums out there, which I'm quite quite liking. Mm. It's mad you can get a lot of the molasses out of it and it, it, a lot of the molasses started to disappear because of that casking program and I think it was those firkins. So the next one we release, I'm sure, will be a bit pared back in that regard because the firkins won't have, well, won't have been just as aggressive as they, as they are, you know, because a lot of that aggression has been taken out in this first batch. But um, you also get a little bit of gingerbread in there too. So like I, I, can, I can sip on that too. And I think it's, I think rum's got a good future in Irish spirit as well. And, this is a good introduction to people as well. You know, a lot of people are afraid of rum, and now they can, if they taste this and they can see that it is worth sipping on, it's a little bit more affordable than, than a whiskey as well. You know, because it, it's a lot less labour intensive. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's great. I haven't got the skill set you have, Ali, to create such a lovely cocktail. I just um, throw a splash of ginger ale in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a nice breakfast drink then. Generation. But there's great there's great drinks like when people think of rum, they always think of like tiki, but Ireland has such good products to be used in a flavorful kind of fruity rum drink, you know, like you have so however many strains of different mint, you've got fresh strawberries, like lovely Wexford strawberries, whatever kind of berries you'd like. You know, there's a lot to be said for a rum that can stand up in a tiki drink like that. And I think we could kind of push people, you know, Irish rum, Irish products, Irish tiki, you know, and this apple juice, and uh lemon and you could even use honey as a sweetener like an a nice irish honey and it's kind of like a it's kind of like a a nice cold apple pie let's say <laughs> you get all the spices coming through from the rum and the nice nice sweet apple yeah i, re I really i'm a big fan i'm glad i got a full bottle for myself not just oh, a little shit. sample <laughs> oh great to hear it's uh, it's funny you were mentioned earlier about bitters bitters is like to me, better should be in every household. It's like a bottle of HP sauce or something. You know, it's, it's it has to be. Yeah. It's a good yeah, you see, you're a HP sauce bottle of household. I, I I haven't had a bottle of HP sauce in my fucking life. So. Ah, come on. Right. You more of a ketchup <laughs> man. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny for me because. Um, I think of rum. I think of so many. It's funny. I I very rarely if ever drink rum in ireland i think the last time i had a daiquiri i was standing last september pre-covid was an athens bar show and i was standing in like 32 degree heat on like the 24th of september just drinking uh rum daiquiris and then after that it was in the middle of november freezing snowing at the hague in the netherlands and i was drinking kind of like heated rum punch kind of daiquiris or not daiquiris rum punch cocktails um and it's just never been a thing that I've imbibed on in Ireland. And I think that it's something like, as you said, Ali, to do kind of an Irish twist. I think there's a lot of flavors there um, that you'd be able to play with. And I know you were slagging me earlier. I was, I was fishing for some at-home cocktails. And you were <laughs> saying, if you don't have, you don't have citrus, you don't have a, you're don't you not making a rum cocktail. So, yeah, because uh, Matt was like, oh, is lime a bit too much for the at-home bartender? I was like, if they don't have lime, they're not going to go far with a rum cocktail. <laughs> like, or true, they don't yeah. have some form of citrus. Yeah. Like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, other bartenders. I see Jean and all are online. Give us a shout there of a cocktail without citrus with rum. You need it. Yeah, you have to. It brings out the citrus and the spread. So you need it. Definitely. Uh, what's, your, what's your cocktail like, Matt? Well, it's gone now. Uh, so, <laughs> so good then. <laughs> and as well, I actually, I actually, uh, to tell a lie, I, I thought I had a stack of limes at home, but I actually had a stack of lemons. So I kind of just swapped out the citrus. So to be honest, it, it worked. It worked for me. Um, it was an improper cocktail, but I, I enjoyed it uh, endlessly. Actually, I actually made two. Um, so uh, and thankfully, I actually had some simple uh, still in the fridge. Um, so I didn't even have to do that much work, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Juice, lemons, had a simple ready, done. Very good, very good. Um, very good. But yeah, so there's a lot of, lot of comments coming in right now. A lot of people uh, very much enjoying uh, the rum. Um, I, I see also a few, I see a few people commenting as well that bitters is pretty much in everyone's home bar. Um, so I think you might be winning in that, in that regard. Uh, but Brendan, why don't you bring us through, I suppose, the, the bread and butter of your distillery, your non-GI uh, pot still uh, whiskey or spirit, should I say. And, and this time it is a non-peated non-GI pot still spirit. Oh, exactly. Well, that's a good point. It's funny. I've seen there's Dahi O'Connell. He said, is he going on about that rum technical thing? <laughs> um, obviously, Cologne, we are a protest distillery that, there's undoubtedly there's corruption in the industry, unfortunately, and the technical files are a joke. Um, Potching isn't made from whey, never was, <laughs> just just wasn't. Um, the technical file is a disgrace. Uh, we shouldn't have. We should the technical file should not say five percent other grains. Any of the best red breasts that I have tasted are the old school mash bills. Um, if you're ever lucky enough to taste old cumber, which thankfully it's been. Uh, you know, revived by a very high quality county kind of down distillery that's not too far from Cologne uh, right now. <laughs> um, you might 
<laughs> you might rhyme with Mexicanville. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> th these things are quality uh, pot stills uh, of old have been neglected, and we've turned our back on our whiskey past. And just because you know uh, a fantastic distillery has you know survived the pot still category doesn't mean that they have the authority to whitewash out a whole mash bill culture. We we brought this mash bill culture to the states, and they've they've done their own thing with it. You know, maybe it's a bit different now than what it was. Um, but it's starting to move back in the right direction over there as well. There's people in Scotland making old Irish mash bills, old Irish pot stills right now that are, that are going to be probably better than our own because we know when we're exper experimenting with mash bills, whenever we make a GI compliant mash bill, it's not as good as a non compliant GI. So, anybody out there tonight who's tasted clone potching before, you know, it's quality stuff. It's great. I, I fucking love it. Pardon me. Sorry. Absolutely. I love it. But, uh, this one here is a non-compliant mash bill. So this is this is what we do as a peated, but this is the first time that we've done it as a non-peated. So we love our peated produce. Uh, Irish whiskey was probably was more peated than it was non-peated, which is another thing that the authorities are trying to whitewash out of bloody technical fact. We'll not go there, but uh, this one today has got you know you your take over the show, man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Ali, I forwarded this mash bill on to you. Have you got it at hand by any chance? Matt, I think I forwarded it on to you as well. Yes. Um, so it's got... Yeah. Um, it don't it Please don't drink this straight. It's 60%. There should be a label on that. Uh, it might not taste 60% because there's a lot more oats in there than you'd think, but, well, a bit more oats than you'd think, but that creates, you know, less aggression on your palate and more flavour, but it's you'll probably end up really drunk. So add a splash of water. Sorry, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> don't, 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 don't presume you know how like, people like to get drunk. Like, come on. <laughs> but yes, yeah, I, I don't know. Ali, do you have the mash bill in front of you? I have it here as well if you if we want to yeah. go through it. 14 yeah. bags. That's that's what you use. 14 bags. In total. Yeah. Ali, do you want to go through it there? Yeah, yeah. It's um so it's fifty percent malted barley, so seven bags, and twenty one point six percent unmalted barley, fourteen point two percent oat, and then ego parts seven point one percent wheat and seven point one percent rye. Excellent. So you notice there, right? We've got like fourteen to fifteen percent oats and then seven percent rye and wheat. So that means that we've got thirty percent of our mash bill being oat, rye and wheat. The current GI only allows for five percent to be oat, rye and wheat. We're talking thirty percent versus five percent. Thirty percent is actually more in keeping with 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 distilleries of old. If you look at the old band in Mashbill, for example, you know it is thirty uh, percent. And I we need to stop now, and I need to say it. thank you very much. You know, you know the likes of Charlie Roach, Brian Green, Fernando O'Connor, people who are doing you know really good solid research into old Irish mash bills. And uh, hats off to the guys and. Uh, the Irish whiskey drinker, the, the heart is in the right place. And I think we're bringing ourselves on our whiskey category into disrepute if we don't have respect for our whiskey heritage. And pot stills of today are amazing and my favorite whiskies. But at the same time, we need to respect for pot stills of old. So whenever you've got an organization that's you know corrupting the legislation, you're only damaging the whiskey category and you're asleep at the wheel. Take a look at overseas and uh, sorry to be ranting, but uh, Take a little taste. <laughs> it's all right. I said, like, I was talking to some people there recently and were amusing on the fact that the Irish whiskey technical file was developed to protect the category from outside uh, imitations and now is simply being used to police the inside gen <laughs> uh, genuine. Uh, Those same organizations. Those same organizations are also attacking small distilleries like Cologne. For putting too much information on the back of the labels and then denying it, even though there's an email to be able to prove it. I have I, I do want to address one thing. We have a, a question in from Stephen uh, Fanan who says he wants to ask a question about launching a whiskey brand. So you can ask whatever questions you want. That's whether or not we'll able to answer it online, uh, or or not, we'll be able to answer it after the fact. And also we have a number of whiskey producers in the in the comments as well. Uh, there's at least six I can see currently. Um, so do uh, do feel free. Uh, <laughs> a good chug chug comment from uh, from Lizzie there. Scared um, me there Lizzie, that photo. <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> exactly. Hey, listen, it's Halloween. It's grand. Um, 
but yeah, there's there's a lot going on in this. Is uh, there's a good oh, yeah, uh, kind amazing. of grasp to it as well on the nose, which I'm liking. This is the first time makes sense. Starting to come back, and all I can get, I get a bit of pain tree. But I'm gonna let you guys take it from here. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's super. It's grassy and earthy on the nose super grassy super earthy and as soon as you taste it it's like an explosion of sweetness like i was actually ta a little taken aback by it when i first tasted it like there's a massive sense of like or smell taste smell taste of vanilla whipped cream biscuits fresh bread everything it's it's amazing it's so creamy it's so smooth i love this and as brendan said earlier it's it if you like the pochin you like this i think uh, Cologne's Pochin is my favorite Pochin on the market. And um, so that makes sense why I like this so much. This is really, really good. Cheers. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot going on in this glass. Um, and actually, one of the big things I think I had to pull from what you're saying, like Lukas has just messaged and saying an amazing nose. I think there's so much going on in the nose of this. Um, but even on the palate, like you said, I, the, the biscuitiness, and then there's there's such a, a level of creaminess to the palate on this like yeah this it, it actually looks like the, the you can almost see the viscosity in the glass um which is amazing um but uh the if you've john o'donovan saying that he's recently found out he's allergic to rye any chance of a non-gi non-peated non-rye whiskey john are you allergic to rye in distilled form or I thought Allergies were taken away by distilled. Yeah, I, I, I'm allergic to wheat, um, as, as I'm sure I've ranted about many times before. Um, and obviously, you know, all the distilled spirits are gluten-free, which is actually a, a fantastic ruling by the US uh, TGB and FDA that you can now put it on any distilled spirits, because um, it used to be the bane of my life. Um, in the US, working with whiskey, people telling me it wasn't gluten-free. Um, but yes, and perhaps uh, John, you can explain a little bit more as to how how we can I suppose, facilitate you a little bit better on. Um, but I'm I'm really enjoying this. And and Brendan, what what a what kind of cast have you put this into for? Or is this coming out as a, as a puchin, or is this going being laid down as a non GI pot uh, pot still? Yeah, it's just going to be non GI pot still. So we're going to do uh, what we what we our cores tend to be two cores. Uh, we want to try and release things as much as possible in single cask form. So it's either going to be in a 100% bourbon or 100% PX sherry cask. And there are going to be, you know, lots of playing around in between. So this one, yeah, it's going to go the same as the others. Uh, uh, obviously, it's not peated. The reason why we didn't do peated is because the oats, uh, the oats that we got, uh, we ran out of our oats, which are grown in the local area. Um, we recently got our new harvest, and they were later this year. And these oats take longer to, um, they have to go through a dormancy phase before you can malt them yourself. So we can't, we tried to malt them and it's failed. So they need to finish their dormancy phase, then we can malt them and then we can peat dry them, smoke them on site. And um, that would follow into our peated whiskies. But this time it's not. So we're just going with 100% non peated. So we're malt and everything's non peated. Uh, we're going to do this for a short period of time. And we're now. Test, testing another little batch of the oats to see if we can smoke those, if we can malt them. And uh, tomorrow, if I come in and I can see tails growing on the on the malt, I think it's brilliant. Then, you know, we're going to go back into peated, but it's good to do a little bit of non peated again and, and see how it goes. But uh, yeah, we need to talk about oats. Oats were a staple <laughs> diet before potatoes, oh. even after potatoes, and when even during the famine, whenever you know. We were being, you know, the country was being robbed of its resources. And, uh, it was oat, it was oat that was being taken overseas and the cattle. Um, there was never a shortage of food in Ireland. It was a very productive country always. And oats were being produced in high qualities and high, high amounts. Oats is or what was used to make pot still whiskey and pochi. And it wasn't bloody 5% oats. It was a lot more than that. So there's a lot of oat in this. And uh, oat, if anybody who, who likes food, if anybody who cooks at home, you know that you put oil in your food. Oil is a vessel for flavor, more so than just stopping your pan burning. So whenever you're using a lot of oil, you're carrying a lot of your spice there with it as well, and a lot of your flavor. Oat is the oiliest of all of the grains. So oat is acting as a vessel to carry that peppery note that comes from your unmalted uh, barley. It carries the spice that's coming with your rye and your wheat as well. 
and it's also carrying those sweet sweet notes that are coming from your malt. So and ne never mind that, it's bringing its own flavour of cream and its own flavour of that milky note as well. So oats can't be underestimated, and that's where you get a lot of flavour in here, it's because of the oat. Ali, how do you think uh, standing in front of your your non whiskey centric consumers and talking about the oats content of uh, of your cocktails, do you think it'd be well received or something that's going to take a little bit uh, of education for the consumers? I think the consumer always needs education. <laughs> 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 to be honest, <laughs> no, I think yeah, I think uh, they enjoy it. They yeah, it. they do. And like that's the one thing I'm missing as well about this the, the whole restrictions and lockdown thing is you miss that customer interaction at the bar. You know how nobody's allowed to sit at a fucking bar counter these days as if it makes any difference. But like you I would always sell basically a spirit or even just give someone more information about something they're drinking or brands that are similar to what they're drinking across the bar and you don't you just don't get that anymore but yeah a lot of people do enjoy that a lot of people do enjoy the technicalities of it even if they don't retain a lot of that information they just mm -hmm. enjoy the chat like this <laughs> it's speak to people in layman's terms you know yeah you wouldn't want a barrister explaining the intricacies of laws or jurisprudence or anything they want them to tell you you know <laughs> in your own words what the hell is going on or anybody in any profession uh you don't want to talk to a builder about you know the U values of a wall, you want them to talk to you about bricks and mortar. So it's all about talking to people about the bricks and mortar of what's happening. So it's a bit relating to people. Ali, your videos are great. Uh, when lockdown hit, you were going out to your back garden, you were picking stuff out of the hedge, you were making <laughs> all the things out of your freezer. Things that anybody can do, you can make a cocktail at home. Uh, and it's the same idea, you know. It's Imagine people just going into the back garden, putting foxglove into cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> Waking up dead. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that, all right. Yeah, go um, Google Lens is a powerful tool for anybody that's foraging. <laughs> Just taking out a picture of it and check if it's poisonous or not. <laughs> that, that is, that is a, a seriously good piece of information. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jarlath is asking, what is the mash bill on this one? He missed it earlier. Uh, yeah. Jarlath, 50%. Malted barley, 21.6 unmalted, 14.2 oats, 7.1 wheat, 7.1 rye. So, so very Jordan, much out of Yeah, this is essentially the peated one that you, you've enjoyed before, uh, except we've taken the peated character out of it. It's all non-peated, so it's the first time we've done it. Um, we've done it for a short period of time. They're um, probably bringing up their clothes very soon. Uh, the malt for this one came from the grown in Dundalk, the oats right. are grown in the lane. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mute myself for a second because the dog is making shy of my apartment. So I'll, I'll, you keep talking. I'll... <laughs> Get him back. It's funny, the dog's becoming more of a celebrity than the Pot Still Show than Matt. Good thing I'm here. You'd be talking to yourself, Brendan. <laughs> You've done that before, actually, one day. <laughs> definitely stop. I know it's good to have a third person just in case. But, uh, though. Here he is. Ah, gorgeous. Hello. Gorgeous. You should leave him on, Matt. You can clear off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. She's, she's been a little bit of a menace today. So, but she's she slept. She's slept through the whole of the show so far. The whole hour and ten minutes. So, she just woke up and started backing around her water bowl, which is unfortunately metal on tiles. So it was making a load of noise. <laughs> Um, What's her favorite so far, the cocktail or the rum? Or uh, give her something sixty percent. <laughs> maybe, maybe not right now. She's yeah, she's only waking up. Maybe give her a little bit, a little while, and she'll be all right. Um, but Ali, Ali, for for you, what 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 has been your favorite so far? And then for everyone else, let us know in the comments what's been your favorite so far. Well, obviously they're all so different. Um, so. What would be my favorite? I'm super excited about the dark rum because of the category and because I just want a fucking a nice Irish dark rum and I love the flavor profile. I love it. Um, this is like you said, similar to the Puchin, which I already fucking love. This is amazing. Maybe a bit too high ABV for me. Maybe needs the dash of water. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, I'm super excited about the stout cask finish, uh, oatmeal stout cask finish as well. This would be definitely in my top three of the 
bonded experimental series that I've tasted. So it's hard to choose, but if I had to choose one now, I'm going to go with the dark rum just for the potential for tiki cocktails, whereas I would drink the other two just by themselves, which is perfectly fine, and it's what I'm used to, but maybe just dark rum for the bit of excitement. That would be yeah. my... It's good to see. It, it, the, the rum's funny. It sort of comes across older than it is. Um, yeah, definitely. I was actually surprised to hear you say it was as young as it was. Like our, our style run for like any of our spirits, they run for twelve hour shift rather than a six hour shift, which is required, you know, for the stills of that size. Um, and other distilleries I've worked in, it's been six hours in each still. And this has been twelve hours in each. It's just the way we run our stills. It's a low flame, direct flame fed heat. But also, you know, creates that burning at the base of the still. That molasses sticking to the, the base of the still and, and charring. Uh, mine hard reaction, is it? Yeah, and I don't know if that exists in, in the rum or not. I don't know how much protein exists in a rum mash. But at the same time, there's bloody burning going on there because I know it firsthand from cleaning it off the base of the still. And then, you know, that, that, um, that, that using that uh, dumper keg, it's just it's such a bloody inefficient system. And uh, it's running through. It doesn't clog up the condensers like the other ones do because there's no solids in there. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lovely note. And uh, it's it's it tastes quite aged when it comes off the still. It's quite fresh, and uh, yeah, so it's it's so versatile. So we're dead happy with it, and we're looking forward to seeing lots of rums coming into the industry now. Um, I well, I I've gone I've gone completely rogue here when I took my uh, Imperial Stout sample with with a splash of water and basically just threw a little bit of the rum into it. And actually, I don't hate it in the slightest. <laughs> I think, uh, Ali, Ali, you can jog off now. I'll be the next. No, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, shit, I've none there. I just <laughs> have a little bit left. Oh, I do have some left. Um, why not? You know? Uh, can I just say as well that this got sold out in Irish malls there? Uh, John was chatting to me a couple of days ago, but we do have some stock left on Celtic Whiskey Shop. So if anybody wants to try the rum, tune in the Celtic Whiskey Shop. Um, I'm going to share the link on my um, on my Facebook post right now. So they have, they have some bottles left there. Thankfully, there's still some out there. And uh, get it into your belly and uh, tell me what you think. I, I was, I'm actually going to say, uh, Brendan, because someone said this to me earlier on the show or before the show that Celtic sold out. And I've literally just Googled it. Celtic is sold out of your rum. Um <laughs> Okay. Do you know what's so weird? I bought, I only bought the dark rum like two days ago, and it was still in stock. I was actually, I was buying myself a bottle of the Puccin, and I saw the dark dark rum, and I was like, oh, I'll get a bottle of that for myself. Yeah, yeah, I say I got probably the last bottle, or maybe the second last bottle. Probably did. It's mental. A couple of days ago, there was only two, but a few bottles sold, so it's it's gone very quick. There, there might be some in KWM Wines, which is a, another Northern Ireland store that that ships ships around around the country, you know. Um, so. That's another option, but uh, God, it's moved fast. Um, so there's another, but uh, yeah, I forget. Unless Liam Brogan wants to suggest anybody else, just stick it onto the chat, Liam. Let us know who else would have it right now in stock. Maddie will call it out. Well, are there are there are there new batches coming down the line? Is Ali going to be able to to whip up some cocktails? Uh, in in the future, um, with with more uh, clone, or is it kind of a one off deal? Yeah, definitely. And if there's a if there's a shop out there that needs some, we'll make sure they get some. If there's a quality bar that needs some, we'll make sure they get them. Um, the Sharkers a cracking bar, but there's also other bars that we're really fond of. We're fond of the fond of the Palace Bar. We're we're fond of uh, the Bank as well in Dublin. And then when you go to Cork as well, they they actually have us on their menu. Uh, the Cask in Cork is a is a brilliant bar. Uh, Linda is great down there as well, and Andy. These guys are, you know, at the forefront of the industry, in my opinion. Um, despite being from Cork, uh, Ali. Oh. Um, <laughs> she's just a Cork. She's like a fish out of water. She's actually from Cork, even though she sounds like a dub. Uh, but no, down there they're great. Uh, we were on, we're on their menu. Our team used to be on their menu in the last last season, but they had an amazing twice got up and they set up the, these fantastic menus, and then COVID comes and, and knocks them out of the water. But so we were actually on the menu there as well, and so we were getting rum to them even before it was released, just to make sure that so we wouldn't we wouldn't see a bar stuck, you know. 
That's um, fair enough. And listen, Ali, it's fine. Someone someone needed to sound like a dub. I, I'm the resident dub here, and apparently I don't sound like a dub at all. So we, we <laughs> I actually I don't take any shy talk for Cork. Both my parents are from Cork. I have a, a strong connection. Unlike most dubs, I don't shy talk them. So great <laughs> great bartenders and great bars there. I won't say another word yeah. about it. <laughs> Connor, Connor Ryan from the from the from Kinsale and, and the folk house and caucus and and also Pierce Lyons is saying there's no shy talk for Anna to court. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't reason that way. I see if your comments coming up. It's the level county for a reason. No. <laughs> so, Brendan, we're, we're coming to a, to a nice end here. Uh, it's a It's been a serious, I suppose, hour and 20 minutes um, of all of the the products we've tried, particularly unveiling your, your 10-year-old uh, oatmeal stout, imperial stout casks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, trying through the rum with the different cocktails and Ali giving us your insights um, the into into what I suppose can be done with, with each of the products. Um, is there anything you want to leave us with, Brendan? Um, yeah. Where we can find things, what's coming next, how you would enjoy things? Yeah, it's just all the guys, you know, I really just, I'm flattered, you know, to see everybody, you know, tuning in, even those who weren't lucky enough to win samples. Um, Thank you very much. It's great to have you. These are the people who are making the brand, and I completely humbled by it. I'm never going. To, you know, it's it's you guys that, that are that are helping us because uh, we do struggle at times. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, today we've we we've raised about two hundred fifty pounds for the malaria consortium. Uh, so we didn't want to charge for posting out these samples. So we asked anybody who received a sample you know, to give a favour to uh, the Malaria Consortium. And the reason why we went there is because apparently it's the most in need and the most effective charity in the world today. So that's why we went there. There's no, no particular other reason. So I really appreciate that for tuning in and, and uh, for, for donating your favor. It makes a big difference, you know. Or if you're in the South, you have to donate six euro of Monopoly money. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Well, I very much appreciate it. Uh, Ali, any words you want to leave us with as well? Any any cocktails or or, or even inspirational videos that you've made you want to leave us with? Uh, or um, I think I will be making some inspirational cologne videos after this now. I'll definitely do some stuff with the dark rum, and I think I'm going to get myself oatmeal stout bottle. Yes, Brendan. Oh, you don't have to pay me for it. I swear it's free. Um, <laughs> Matt, where, online, Ali, if people want to check you out online, where should they be looking? Oh, yeah, I do. If anyone wants to see, I do most of my videos on Instagram. It's at Ali Hayes, but it's A-L-I-H-A-Z-E-E. -E. Maybe another E. There's two or three E's. I don't know. I've had a couple of drinks tonight, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find me. It'll come up. It says cocktail bartender in my name. But, um, yeah, no, uh, everything I tasted tonight, regardless of what's my favorite, was fucking delicious keep smashing out the delicious liquids brendan and cologne and thanks very much matt for having me and thanks everybody for watching yeah not a problem and brendan before we go if people want to find you online who haven't already found you online where should they be looking uh cologne distillery yeah facebook and twitter and instagram yeah we try to use them as much as we can but sometimes we're a bit busy but yeah we, we appreciate all the crack and all the support um if you're lucky enough to get in the cologne cult that's that's a group that the event you let me into as well. Uh, they're good fun there too. But you don't have to sacrifice that much to be a part of it. You don't. No, no, you need to pick your membership number, right? I know Paul's <laughs> listening. He's kicking people out if they didn't pick a membership number. I don't know what the membership number gets you, but if you didn't pick one, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> I can see one. So, yeah. I don't know what that is, and I'm a member, so please don't kick me out if you see this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what I don't have into yet. Matt Martin, <laughs> Paul Keane, Belfast Whiskey Club, and John McDougall, a.k.a. <clears throat> and, <laughs> yeah. So, but exactly. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much, guys, uh, for everything. I uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you, Brendan, for the kits to send it to everyone who's been watching at home. Uh, to everyone who's watching at home with or without the kits, absolutely delighted. Um, Make sure to share, I suppose, possible live with all of your whiskey loving friends or your non whiskey loving friends and get them into the world of Irish whiskey. And also remember, uh, last or not last week, next week, um, on Friday, we are doing another possible live takeover, and that is uh, the launch of the Dingle uh, single pot still batch four with their first ever cast strength single pot still. So make sure to tune in from that. 
eight o'clock on Friday next week. But uh, Ali, Brendan, and to everyone else at home, thank you so much for your time, guys. I've really much appreciated it. No bother. Thanks, man, guys. Oh, thank you.